afternoon, everybody. And uh, may I say it's an enormous pleasure and a great <coughs> privilege. It's an honor to be here. And especially uh, delightful uh, to honor the memory of and the legacy of Lemaitre. And I'd like to thank Thomas and Lane and Anna Lane and the organizers very much. Okay, so my, uh, I'm a philosopher of physics uh, f who began life in philosophy and then got interested in physics. It's a happy prescience by the uh, maybe omniscient Thomas to have put me after Sean because I think I fit well with Sean. I'm going to uh, uh, take a step back from uh, the quantum and do some philosophy but I will, in fact, at the end, uh, talk about Everetti and quantum mechanics in a cosmological setting. And I will go at a fast pace, telling you, as philosophers like to do, uh, their whole theory of the universe, but you're highly intelligent and 20 minutes will be ample. Uh, I would also say that the dominating themes will really be, uh, on the one hand, a philosopher's anxiety about what is possibility, or as we say in philosophy, modality, the possible, the, uh, what is not actual but could have been, what exactly does it uh, uh, commit us to, to uh, embrace non-actual possibilities in order to make sense of the world. Uh, it's also true that um, in a, another theme will be so to speak, as we say in modern America, I think, I am going to channel, meaning manifest to you, uh, my inner Hartle Hertog Hawking. Right, you'll see that at the end. Um, but we'll, we'll go at this um, uh, in three phases. So my overall question is, how does our being observers affect the scope and the content of what we know? But with an eye on cosmology, first classical and then quantum. So first of all, I'm going to do pure philosophy uh, without mentioning physics, really. And this will bring out the topic, what is possibility? Then I'll turn to classical physics and cosmology, where the what is possibility question will become a bit more sharp and painful, what is chance? And then I'll turn to quantum physics and cosmology, and there, I won't officially sign up in the way Sean nobly and honorably did to ever is the way, but I will, uh, in the manner of this is a good case to consider, I will go, go that way. The one slide will admit to you that I'm basically unhappy. The measurement problem is a scandal of physics. Uh, the great C.D. Broad, Cambridge philosopher, said that Hume, having discovered the problem of induction in the 1720s and despaired of solving it, left us with an agonizing intellectual legacy of a big, big problem. And I agree with Broad, it's still not solved. I wish I could report that we'd solved the problem of induction, despite people like Karl Popper saying you, to you there's no problem. Uh, that's one of those very f few Vienna mistakes. You know, Popper was from Vienna, the wonderful things from Vienna, <laughs> Schrodinger, but Boltzmann indeed, but not Karl Popper in that regard. So in any case, uh, the scandal of philosophy is what Broad called the problem of induction. The measurement problem is the scandal of physics. 90 years and it's still not hammered. You know, it's not good. So these will be what we do. The, the observer, regardless of physics, uh, that's pure philosophy. Then the classical world. I will be settling on uh, the Shrednitsky hartle proposals for how to think about anthropic reasoning from 10 years ago. And then I will be following into the uh, Hartle, Hawking, Hertog discussion of the Everett interpretation of the universal state. So, stepping way back, what is our, our problem? Our problem is that natural philosophy and physics from Galileo, on, Galileo onwards uh, describes a world apparently not appealing to uh, the properties that seem presented to us in what a uh, famous American philosopher called the manifest image of the world rather than the scientific image. Uh, Democritus already said it, um, and therefore we need to close the circle. We need to in some way recover within science's uh, world picture a description of our experience. And nowadays, people who feel there's a, a, an insoluble problem, you can't close the circle, uh, refer to what are called in philosophy qualia, 
meaning the redness of the of a rose, or I believe uh, Einstein's probably apocryphal, like a lot of Einstein quotes. Einstein is meant to have said, "Science can't give you the taste of chicken soup," which is a nice Jewish version of the redness of the rose. Uh, the other thing that people consider deserving of the word subjective is I and now and here. And timely action needs thoughts with the content of I and now and here. I could not get to lunch on time if I, if I didn't say noon is now. If I knew simply lunch is at noon and lunch is in a room different from where I am, I wouldn't go to the lunch. Another aspect of being an observer, you, m many of you will know, it's Eddington's metaphor. Uh, he actually was using it for a rather different purpose, but it's deployed for discussion of anthropic principle, as in Professor Gustafson's earlier lecture. Uh, the idea is the, there's a lake, the fishermen go fishing, they catch their fish, the mesh in the net is as it might be 10 centimetres, they look at their fish, they're all longer than 10 centimetres. They say, aha, the fish in the lake are all 10 centimetres or more long. That is called biased sampling. Right? A finer mesh might well have caught some smaller fish. And here uh, are some uh, uh, quotes from noble <coughs> living heroes making this point. The first is uh, Jim Hartle and Thomas Hertog. What is most probable to happen need not be what is most probable to be observed. And the second is from Frank Wilczek in, the, uh, in a Bernard Carr anthology of some eight years ago. Um, the point is that, that we don't normally need in everyday examples of sampling to be very careful to remember the form of our observation or sampling. But uh, political poll people know that they have to do this because it happened in the 1930s in the USA. They, they mispredicted the US election because they asked people their views by phoning them. But it, rich Republicans had phones in the 1930s and poor Democrats didn't. But thank goodness Roosevelt won, right? Um, so they thought the Republican would win. Uh, in a word, it's like at the bottom. Our expectations should be conditioned on what we believe about the process of observation. Another big theme, the legacy of Kant, about the role of the human uh, constitution in our knowledge. Maybe our beliefs and even what we know have some kind of human contribution which cannot be eradicated. And this has various meanings in various great philosophers, and I would recommend uh, Ian Hacking's book of 15 years ago, which helpfully distinguishes uh, in about the third, fourth chapter, these three meanings. I won't linger on that, but uh, I myself would say yes to those three questions because I am, next slide, I'm confessing to you quickly so that we have good discussions over the next uh, two days. I am a realist, and I say, as they say in Australia, no worries. Right? A lovely, vivid Australianism. So as to this last one about uh, uh, stability of <coughs> knowledge, uh, maybe it's true that either the species or the culture or the individual do contribute ineradicably to the content of what we know. But this kind of human contribution is, I would maintain, compatible with what we call in philosophy a correspondence theory of truth, which was first stated by Aristotle and is especially now associated with Tarski because of his formal definition of correspondence notion of truth in the 1930s. Well, that's about logic and, and truth rather than about our uh, belief or knowledge, but I think also a kind of ineradicable contribution uh, to our knowledge is compatible with B with our having good reason to believe theories. And it is even compatible with our formulating and even confirming a theory of the whole world, a toe, uh, whose general propositions or some elite subset of its general propositions are laws of nature. And here, with a view to connecting to other sessions, I wanted to just write down that uh, 
the amazing unity of nature, you know, historians of science will now say there was a second scientific revolution from 1850 to 1950, just as important as that, that stretched from Copernicus to Newton. And uh, the amazing unity of nature that we've seen repeatedly today, actually, in particular, the, there was the uh, excellent spectroscopy slide showing, you know, helium was named on the basis of being found in solar spectral lines. Helios was the Greek sun god. It was 27 years later that it was discovered on Earth. And uh, the idea that the chemical constitution of the stars might well thus <coughs> correspond to that being found on Earth was, was uh, greatly supported. So we, we, we live in the afterglow, not just of the CMB, but in the afterglow of 150 years of wonderful science discovering the unity of nature. This does raise a question that Eugene Bidner has asked us, which we'll discuss another time. OK. But my anxiety here is what is a possibility? Uh, how much does stating the truth in everyday life or in science or in philosophy require you to accept non-actual possibilities? And here's three things, three scenarios or areas where this happens. An agent thinks and acts, and economists, decision theorists, psychologists, cognitive scientists, everyday life, when you try to explain your relatives and friends' behavior, you are constantly thinking in terms of deliberation, decision, non-actual possibilities. So how can we make sense of that if we say, I can only mention what actually occurs? Um, there's one actual course of events in some purely physical system, say, but we wish to speak of objective tendencies or chances for various possibilities to occur. Is that in some way a, an abbreviated or obscure report of some feature of the actual course of events? And finally, and coming back to the concept of a toe, a false theory might have been true. It might even have been the whole theory of the world. There is some sense in which classical vacuum electromagnetism is logically possible. There are vacuum solutions of uh, Maxwell's equations in Minkowski space-time. I mean, one could put in matter and then face the anxieties that uh, Lawrence and the others ever since uh, the late 19th century faced about the duality between uh, field and particle and the nature of the matter-radiation interaction. But if you're anx anxious about inconsistencies there, just consider classical vacuum electromagnetism. What exactly are these possibilities that we are, in life and in science and in philosophy, obliged to talk about? What exactly does such a possibility consist of? I would like to confess to you, uh, talking about scandal of philosophy, the, there's another scandal of philosophy that we philosophers have not got a consensus yet about what a possibility is. It's generally regarded to be a very deep problem, and it go, of course there is discussion of modality amongst the brilliant medieval philosophers and logicians, and also by Leibniz. The topic then drops out until the 20th century when it comes back, and one of the gurus of uh, philosophy, David Lewis, uh, has a striking doctrine which uh, we can talk about over a beer. He believes that all the possible worlds are equally real, we just happen to be in one of them. They are not in any spatio-temporal relation to them, to, to us, but they are no more abstract than our own cosmos. Right? So there are actually three kinds of multiverse. There's the kind of Leibniz-Lewis multiverse, there's the cosmological multiverse, which we'll turn to, and as, as uh, uh, Sean uh, fortuitously emphasised before he turned to cosmology, there's the quantum or Everett multiverse. Okay, so this, uh, as regards my second theme then, the observer in a classical world, uh, I would say, setting aside cosmology, that I am, as I said, basking in the sunlight of the world picture of modern science, and I don't have a problem about observers, as my no worries, relaxed, realist attitude conveyed. I do have, when I turn to classical physics, an aggravated problem about the nature of possibilities, because I am facing in classical thermal physics what seem to be objective probabilities. And 
This is a live issue in the foundations of classical thermal physics, how to understand chance. But what about cosmology in a classical setting? This is where we begin to get into the, the, the anthropic reasoning issue. First of all, apart from the idea of uh, anthropic reasoning and Eddington's net, one might say, can I, an agent or a thinker or an observer, in a cosmos, using thought and language, formulate a proposition about the whole cosmos? I'm in it, in the cosmos, can I formulate this proposition without a logical paradox? Well, I believe you can. You didn't, this proposition was not required to describe the whole cosmos in full detail. It just was about the cosmos. It doesn't have to be the whole truth. Maybe it's even possible for it to be the whole truth and nevertheless be formulated by an agent within. So I ex would say again, no worries, but I do admit there are, prob again, the problem of what is a possibility. And I would also say it can be very hard in cosmology to determine certain things like the global structure of a general relativistic space-time. But I want to focus on uh, the dreaded A word. Uh, you will need no reminding of the fact that uh, the degree of fine-tuning is often stunning. We've seen it and discussed it today. More embarrassing, we need no reminding that fundamental physical theory nowadays faces grave difficulties. Right? We've seen that come up in various ways. As to philosophy, I would warn you not to imagine that we philosophers have a consensus about a tight meaning for the word explain. In fact, there are some who say explain is very context sensitive. It's really a matter of satisfying the inquirer in the particular context of inquiry. There is no real essence of explanation. So saying anthropic explanations aren't satisfying uh, may be a very good report of your own dissatisfaction and your desire for a different kind of understanding, but uh, it's not as if there is an agreed theory of explanation on the shelf in the philosophy library that you can deploy to ascertain whether anthropic explanations are uh, adequate. But returning to Eddington's net, this is the main point, there is a notion of a biosample or a background population dominating one's intuitions, uh, or dominating uh, the, uh, the arguments that one needs to conditionalize on a description of how you observe. But, um, right, thank you. But the uh, need to conditionalize uh, doesn't depend upon there being exact replicas of you as an observer. You don't need to have doppelgangers. Uh, and you, you, you don't need to have other observations occurring. In Eddington's metaphor, there can be bias sampling even if there is only one fishing trip in the lake. Right? Uh, but if we have, in a cosmological setting, and this is a notation I'll use in the coming slides, a theory T and a cosmological parameter lambda, and you want to make sense of a probability of that parameter taking a certain value, conditional on the theory, does that require the actual existence of other domains where lambda takes other values? Does having a probability of two-thirds or one-third or a quarter for lambda taking the value 17, does that require that there will be, so to speak, to make sense of the one minus that probability, domains where it takes values other than 17? That depends upon your, your philosophy of probability. And so the predicament in confirming a multiverse theory is that, in fact, modern cosmology since the late uh, 70s, mid-80s has given us uh, a multiverse conception of a set of non-interacting domains where we live in just one. And uh, the overarching question thus becomes, how can we possibly confirm a theory that postulates uh, such domains where we can only have 
direct evidence of our own. And I here want to uh, pay tribute to Faraz Azar, who has led me into this field, and uh, follow him in endorsing uh, uh, the, the scheme uh, articulated by Hartle and Srednitsky, uh, following on uh, excellent papers for uh, this large literature, we've not read it all, but Aguirre and Ted Mott's very clarified uh, 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 papers led into the Hartle Srednitsky scheme, and uh, Hertog, of course, uh, in recent work with Hartle and partly with Hawking follows up on this. So Aguirre and Tegmark really articulate a sequence of issues that need to be faced in a multiverse classical cosmology. Uh, Aguirre has a fine paper saying there are seven big conceptual problems, but they can be collapsed into these three. And uh, you, there's a problem of measure. There is the one I've been emphasizing, that we need to characterize our observational situation and conditionalize on observation, uh, on the process of observation. And then there is the question of typicality. If uh, we have observations which are very far in the tails of a probability distribution, we would regard the uh, theory that gave that distribution as being disconfirmed. But how much under the tails could we be without inferring that we're disconfirmed? So, Srednitsky and Hartle use frameworks, what they call a framework. Uh, it's a conjunction of a cosmological theory or model T, which, which we imagine solves the measure problem, so there are probabilities conditional on T. There's also the specification of how we are observing, or there are observational situation, as in the, the Hartle and uh, Wilczek quotes. So there's a probability of T is a probability of things conditional on both T and C. And finally, there is what is called a xerographic distribution, which is a, a, an assumption about how typical you are in what is allowed by T and C. And Srinitsky, Hartle, and, and the following them as are, have shown how the, in a Bayesian overarching uh, approach to confirmation, uh, one can confirm multiverse theories uh, considered as conjunctions of a theory, a conditionalization scheme, and a xerographic distribution. Okay. So finally, uh, the, the quantum. Well, in the, in the opening decades of quantum theory, the measurement problem uh, uh, prompted a variety of radical proposals for the observer to take a fundamental role. The observer often had a formal representative that looked rather innocuous, as in Bohr, namely a, an orthogonal basis of the state space. That is to say, the choice of a classical context was formally implemented as a set of uh, mutually orthogonal vectors. Uh, OK, I've confessed openly my realism. I dislike all these invocations of the uh, fundamental role of the observer. I stand with the great Ulster physicist John Stuart Bell, but much of the philosophy literature, I confess, philosophy of quantum theory literature, overly uh, emphasizes the, what I call the usual suspects uh, listed there. There are other alternatives, which we can talk, talk about over beers tonight, but I am going to um, go to the Everett interpretation of the envisaged quantum state of the cosmos. So big psi, is, is, it's capitals now because it's the state of the cosmos. That's, that's how you know it's the state of the cosmos in these discussions, it's capitalized. Um, so the overarching question or idea is that there is some kind of uh, generic branch, better perhaps to say history, which is going to contain a classical multiverse in the sense of part two uh, of the type described by the Hartle-Srednitsky frameworks. Now, overarching merits of any such research program is that are oh, the problems of what is a probability going to solve? We're doing quantum theory. Qu the quantum state provides probabilities. Uh, and this happens in Hartle, uh, uh, Hawking and Hertog in a consistent histories approach, which of course Hartle has made a, uh, uh, an enormous effort in with Gell-Mann over the years. Uh, it is true that 
uh, adding appropriate details which specify the capital C, the proposition about condition about the conditions of observation, one can get probabilities for what we observe, which are not the probabilities in general for what happens. And furthermore, symmetries can help you calculate probabilities with what uh, Hartle and Gelman uh, and Hartle and Hertog call coarse graining, but what a probability theorist would call taking a marginal by summing over unobserved events. And there are wonderful technical questions about, uh, abounding here. Uh, one is what is the uh, what is the state of the universe? Here is the uh, famous no boundary proposal, and Thomas has told me that I have zero minutes, so I shan't talk about this slide, and I shan't talk about this slide except to say I agree with Sean about vacuum fluctu quantum fluctuation, and uh, it came up in another talk too. I will simply go to the last two slides saying that um, the topic is how should we relate Psi to inflation then, <coughs> so as to get a classical multiverse. We have problems. I said technical questions abound. There are many models of inflation, and there are different mechanisms of eternal inflation. I mean, fundamentally, false vacuum and slow roll. There are also various ways in which there is a quantum classical transition that occurs in the uh, overarching studies. But, final slide, I wish to commend to you Hartle, Hawking and Hertog, who uh, have the general merits that I listed in the previous slide, and in simple models such as mini superspace with quadratic potential, they are able not only to exhibit inflation, but even to have just the, as Joe Silk was talking, I think, uh, uh, 60 e-folds. You can get a large enough number of e-folds to, to uh, get the uh, accommodation between uh, inflation and observation. Uh, broad conceptual questions, of course, are, frankly, the measurement problem. I won't try to read that out. There, is a, there are questions about uh, the adequacy of the evidence I'm Mr. Scott, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Sure. So, a question about the consistency of the Everettian view of cosmology. So, we need quantum fluctuations to drive into the season, to drive into the strata. Yet, where is the external observer? enables me to generate this fluctuation. Is it even a, is it even a consistent story? Uh, yeah, I, well, I believe that, the, uh, I, I use the word quantum fluctuation. I think this is language pretty similar to that which was explicit in Sean's talk. I would say <coughs> quantum fluctuation is really jargon for non-zero complex amplitude for more than one alternative typically classical alternatives like different configurations in a configuration. Thermal fluctuation really does, as it's, it, I mean, it was a word used already in 1910, Smolotrovsky and so on. It, it means that there is a jitter in a variable that has a genuine, unproblematic real number value, right? So I think the, we need the quantum, fluctuations with the probabilities that are encoded in the Born rule to transition appropriately into classical uh, thermal fluctuations of which we can, if we're back in the philosophy of probability game, we can say in a sufficiently large population the various alternatives will occur with actual frequencies which sufficiently match the theoretical probabilities given by the Born rule turned into a classical probability. So, so, so the decoherence at some point yeah, produces the things I see on the sky. So yeah. So there's a, there's 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 a I think lots of things are involved in this transition. I I've only read somewhat in the field. I see that commutators go to zero between the inflaton and its conjugate momentum in this super horizon limit. So, so small commutators is one thing. Decoherence is another. Choice of a special state that can give you something like WKB is a third. I mean, 
So states, quantities, and processes, all three pillars <coughs> of the basic framework of thought need to be invoked. Sure, maybe you want to call yeah. them. Yeah. yeah, just very quickly on exactly that. I mean, the things we see in the cosmic microwave background are a measurement of the quantum state of the infoton, which in the Bredian language means decoherence happened. And it's obvious decoherence happens at the very latest at reheating, where you develop a lot of entropy that becomes correlated with the fluctuations. But if you go more carefully into it, decoherence is actually happening during inflation. Different loads, a few e volts after they cross out the Hubble radius, become entangled with each other. So that's effectively a measure. Yeah, but you talked a lot about observers and external observers. So, but all what I talked about talked them in the about sense of saying there external. aren't any. Sorry. No, there aren't any other external observers. That, that was the sense in which I was talking about them. Eisenberg and Bohr wanted them. Everett does away with them. There are no external observers. There's only branches of the Exactly. Way. So is it consistent then to, to, to have the coherence of producing fluctuations, right? And yeah, yeah, that's exactly a, that, that's an example of the kind of process that Sean showed. Yeah. Yeah. The coherence does away with observers. Did Nico here and the rest of the evolution of the observers come to them? It's a particular classical reality. Okay, maybe in the interest of time, we should move on. I've also noticed in an interdisciplinary workshop, lots of things come up which have to be discussed over the years, so <laughs> <laughs> keep time. Uh, thank you, Jeremy.